the presentation about, about battery 2030 plus and what we are that are hosting this seminar. We are a large scale research initiative in, in Europe for battery research. And we have a roadmap we are following and we comprised of 102 organizations all over Europe, um, spread over Europe in 24 different countries, which is quite impressive. And we are organized in six uh, different uh, research projects where I am coordinating us all the projects to sort of communicate and work together according to the roadmap. And the roadmap you find on our webpage, I'll show you the address soon. And we have now worked for one year and we are starting to actually show some results. We have some success stories. We have made a battery equipped with a full set of sensors, ultrasonic piezo polymer, piezo ceramic and the electric elastomer sensors to probe pressure, temperature, etc., in the battery cell, within the battery cell, with much higher resolution before. We have made self-healing functionalities under development and uh, as a self manufacturing to really benchmark uh, the self healing functionalities were done for some electro materials like core shell NMC particles. We have uh, synthesized liquid crystalline electrolytes and piezoelectric separators to hinder dendrite the growth in metallic patches. We have made an electronic lab book. We have made an app, an app store. I think Thais will tell you a little bit more about that. And uh, we have published the largest data management plan you can find in the literature, which is, I think, quite impressive. And above all, we have a lot of exchange and collaboration between these six projects to exchange knowledge, but also set data standards. And we also think it's extremely important to connect to experts all around the world. And that's why we have these excellent seminars where we are so grateful that we'll sure wake up in early in the morning in Stanford in California to be part, part of this. And then these are sort of linked to the roadmap we have, they're free. And we will continue with these free seminars throughout 2022 as well. And we started this fall with Professor Hong Li from China, Shirley Meng from US, or Monta Cabanas from, from uh, Montserrat Casas from CIC in Spain. We have collected the presentations, we have texted them according to the European regulations, and you find them here on our website. But our big start today is our guest speaker, Will Show, and uh, with the title Design Better Batteries Faster Forecasting Performance and Aging. And uh, I think. Uh, all the achievements uh, that uh, Will Chu has uh, shown earlier in his career will be presented by Thais, who will be the moderator for this session. So thank you all and welcome to this uh, seminar. I leave the floor to you, Thais. Thank you, Christina. And thank you in particular, Will, for showing up this early. Um, we're super happy to have you here. I will just share um, my slides here, if I can get... Uh, the sharing to work. Just, I will. Oh, sorry, I'll just run it the other mode here. Just one second. Here we go. So, Will, it's great to have you here. And what uh, I would like to uh, to just do first here, I agreed with Christina to sort of set the scene for your presentation today and try and, and talk a bit about why it's so important for you could say for the European battery community, but for, for Big Map and uh, Battery 2030 Plus at large to hear about the great work that you're doing. And I sort of tried to put together a couple of slides to outline uh, what we can actually hope to get from, uh, from using AI in the context of, of battery research. And uh, stealing a quote from uh, Dash Punk here in the title, I think uh, I'll just uh, move along and try and uh, and explain a bit about uh, what it is that uh, we are hoping to, uh, to get out of the lecture today. But before introducing our staff today, uh, Professor William Hugh from, from Stanford, uh, 
I would uh, like to, to, like I said, set the scene a bit, and uh, then I'll introduce Will uh, towards the end of this uh, short introduction. So setting the scene, I, I really like to take a, a sort of a step back and look back in, uh, in, in time in order really to understand why it's, it's necessary for us to accelerate the discovery of, of, uh, of new battery chemistries and, and cell designs. So if we look back uh, over the last uh, 120 years or, or more, we see these incremental developments within specific battery chemistries. And uh, if we look more specifically at the, you can say the origin of lithium ion battery and the commercialization in 1991, and look at, dive in a little bit closer and look at the, at the developments um, in lithium ion um, cell uh, performance, we see that it's a relatively slow increase, right? And if we wanna make radical transformative jumps forward, how do we do this? Well, one of the ways is by looking back and trying to learn from, uh, from what's been done historically and see if there are ways around uh, uh, sort of accelerating the discovery process. And I think that's one of the, the key topics of, uh, of, of what we are discussing here today and what I will also be addressing, ways to transform from this linear growth in uh, in energy density and capacity and obtain new ways of, uh, of developing uh, new battery chemistries. And I think if we're looking at the, the new battery chemistries, you can say chemistries of the future, I mean, there are many potential chemistries in play. Uh, some are, you can say, to a large extent, incremental improvements, uh, but there are also some that require transformative leaps and getting the sufficient insights and understanding to develop these battery chemistries uh, in a much, much faster way is one of the paths that uh, AI offers. And I'd like to take sort of a little bit of setting the scene from the battery 2030 plus perspective in order to, uh, to, to see how we view uh, uh, the accelerated discovery of future chemistries. So from battery 2030 plus, uh, Christina already outlined the six projects, but if you can say that sort of the common theme that what we're trying to do is to develop an infrastructure that allows us to create ultra high performance, fully sustainable and smart batteries, but doing it in a much faster way. And, and one of the ways that we view it is that AI can really play an, inform uh, an important role in developing versatile, modular and chemistry neutral platforms for accelerating uh, battery discovery. And if we look a bit more in, in, in detail at what AI can actually do, I think I'd like to set it up as a sort of a two-pronged approach here. Uh, we can say that we can definitely get uh, insights to help us develop better batteries. But if you look at it in two ways, one could be to use AI to accelerate the actual discovery process for new batteries. It could be to do fully autonomous synthesis processes like we see here on the left-hand side where we have automated robotics that can integrate analytics uh, data from the uh, cell assembly from the characterization process that can then be helped to uh, improve the actual discovery cycle. But there are also other avenues, and I think Bill will touch upon this uh, today, where you can say we can actually also use AI and machine learning approaches to get more out of the batteries that we already have. And there are two quite different timescales involved in the two processes. So it's definitely two prongs that can be, you can say, approached at the same time but they operate at quite different timescales. So if I focus a bit on the first year uh, in the beginning and think like the acceleration of the actual discovery cycle, why is that needed? Well, of the historic battery data that I showed you before, a lot of that uh, to a very large extent has been based on, on sequential and to some degree also Edisonian development uh, processes. Lithium ion, approximately 20 years from discovery to commercialization. And then it's been here for another 30 years doing outstanding, uh, uh, enabling outstanding uh, breakthroughs, but still same fundamental principles. And a lot of that also boils down to this sequential process where you start from materials prediction, whether it's from modeling or, or pen and paper analysis, you can do a synthesis, you validate whether you actually synthesize the material that you proposed originally. You can then characterize the material to see whether it actually performs as you had hoped. Assuming all of these, uh, are successful, then you can go to cell level testing and modeling, end up ultimately with pack level uh, testing and modeling, but all of these steps require successful completion of the other. Looking at AI, 
the integration, development of closed loop uh, discovery infrastructures, like I'm, I'm certain that Will will touch upon in his lecture, is a potential way of transforming this sequential process. And if I dive in a bit at the closed loop of discovery, and in particular AI from the perspective of, of the so-called big map project and, and battery trend 30 plus, but many of the accelerated infrastructure uh, projects on, on batteries is really, if we can develop a closed loop infrastructure that integrates traditional pillars in battery research by uh, enabling shared data infrastructures that allows data to flow between the pillars, ultimately all the way up to cell production and inclusion of, of end user data. This is one of the ways that we can accelerate the, the new discovery process. And in particular, I would like to highlight two aspects of, of uh, such a closed loop infrastructure like we're trying to develop in, in the Big Map project. That is one, developing an infrastructure that allows us to exchange and utilize data across these different pillars, creating common languages and ontology for, for, for battery uh, interfaces and, and battery materials, but also the ability to accelerate the description and the analysis of, uh, of battery data, whether it be new materials or interfaces. And that's, that's really one of the areas where, where we see uh, the, the excellent contribution Will and others are providing here is providing a, a way to fast track the development. If we look just briefly at, at what is done now, uh, you can say you can do machine learning for improved understanding of existing materials, whether it's uh, understanding electrode uh, structures, uh, doing uh, deep learning on, uh, on, on different uh, experimental uh, techniques or analyzing data and obtaining a much better understanding of the actual battery data, whether it is doing, you can say, high uh, throughput type of uh, analysis, taking, for instance, all the uh, materials in the ICSD, screening them as potential electrode materials, using machine learning to optimize uh, composition or structure to give you certain open circuit voltages. So you can say that's sort of one, one approach to uh, developing uh, new battery materials that you can make these predictions, but it's only a very small part of, of the entire infrastructure that's needed to develop the new batteries. Another aspect that also grows with the complexity is something that we're also looking at in, uh, in battery 2030 plus is then the ability to describe the reactions that take place at, at interfaces, for instance, developing neural network potentials that allows you to describe complex interfacial processes like the formation and, and dynamics of the solid electrolyte interface. But this requires a new class of, of machine learning potentials that can capture these very large variations in inter and intramolecular forces. So all of these are, you can say, paths that feed into one big infrastructure like the so-called big map or battery interface genome materials acceleration platform, where all of these pillars speak together. But what I've tried to illustrate here is that although uh, an approach like this really has uh, the potential to, to transform the way that we do batteries or reinvent the way we invent batteries. It's also a process that if I'm maybe a little uh, self-critical, trying to get faster, but doing it in a slow process. This requires quite a bit of work in a number of different areas in order to, to, to get to a point where we can actually have a platform that's chemistry neutral, versatile, and will allow us to, uh, to accelerate the discovery of emerging battery chemistries. And with the high demand for, for new batteries and, and improved performance of batteries, it's by far, you can say, important to look at what can we actually get out of existing batteries? Can we use digitalization uh, to optimize the utilization process? And here, uh, Will, uh, as in many other fields that I'll get to in a second, is one of the, the pioneers in using uh, machine learning technologies to actually try to optimize uh, battery performance and utilization. And what is key to, I would say, uh, to actually improving the performance of the, the batteries we already have is there's a huge potential for optimizing the use of, of, of batteries through different strategies like I hope we'll hear about. You can look at it like buildings, right? We're all looking at uh, renewable sources for energy, whereas insulation in most parts of the world or better buildings could be, uh, could be an alternative uh, to that. What is it that we're hoping to get out of these? I hope Will can, can definitely educate us on this. But one thing is with models like this, we might be able to predict 
um, using data from different chemistries, predict the performance of battery chemistries that we haven't seen, maybe even also learn about the battery history and the underlying physics. One thing that I'm sure about is that we can learn from the uh, excellent speaker that we have today uh, for our excellent seminar. Uh, super happy that we have uh, Professor Will Chu from Stanford with us uh, today. Uh, Christina already mentioned uh, Will is a professor, associate professor at the Material Science and Engineering at, at Stanford University. He holds an, an MS and a PhD from, uh, from Caltech in, uh, in material science, also a BS in applied uh, physics. Uh, and although, and no, uh, no age discrimination at all, although Will is very young, he is already a very esteemed uh, researcher in the field. He holds a number of, uh, of uh, different uh, positions and affiliations. Uh, so in addition to uh, the material science and engineering uh, position, he's also a senior fellow at the Precord Institute of Energy at Stanford. He is the faculty co-director of the Storage X Initiative. Uh, I think uh, many of you have, have been following. Christina has also uh, been invited there. He's also faculty director for Energy Innovation and Emerging Technologies program at Stanford and a faculty scientist at, uh, at Slack. I think one thing that I would like to emphasize is, is also the academic uh, credentials, you can say. Will has authored nearly 100 uh, publications. And if you have the time, I would recommend you just take a, a quick look at his, his profile. And I think about will correct me if I'm wrong. I think about half of your papers are in one of these tier one uh, journals in the field. Uh, so outstanding quality of science from, uh, from Will's group. But he also has a keen, uh, you can say, eye for the commercial applications of, of these technologies and he holds uh, 11 patents. And uh, as you might've noticed, since Will is up at uh, 6 a.m. to give this talk, he also gives a lot of talks at, and presentations at, at conferences and workshops. And I think uh, I would like to highlight uh, that it's actually more than 180 invited presentations uh, already. He has made a number of, of contributions in several fields. Uh, it doesn't just include battery materials, breakthrough uh, discoveries in fuel cells and, and catalysis. And really, like I said, keeping a focus on the fundamentals, but how the fundamentals have impact on, on the potential applications. And I would like to just wrap up this uh, short introduction by, uh, by name, uh, listing a few of, of, of Will's awards and, and honors. Uh, many of you have seen, uh, seen Will either receiving uh, the Amaris Outstanding Young Investigator Award or the BSF uh, Science Award in Lecture Chemistry, but it's actually a quite long list. And uh, I only included uh, six of these. Uh, you might also know the Sloan Research Fellowships or the, uh, the uh, National Science Foundation Career Awards. So we could have continued this uh, for, uh, for quite some time, but I think the most important thing that I would like to, uh, to add is that on top of this, Will is also a, a great lecturer. So I would like to uh, ask uh, Will to, uh, to take over from here and, uh, and give his, uh, his presentation. Thank you, Will. And maybe just before you start, Will, just for those that uh, have burning questions, please put them in the Q&A. After Will's talk, there will be time for the Q&A and I'll try and organize it and, uh, and you'll get a chance. Will, please go ahead. All right, Thijs, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Christina and Thijs for the invitation and Thijs for that extensive and elaborate introduction. I am truly honored to be here. And let me just start by resonating with Thijs an important point that he made a few minutes ago which is, can we accelerate the pace of battery R&D, but do so slowly? Uh, I think that will be one of the major themes of my talk today. So I revised my title slightly, I refined it a bit, and I really wanna focus on this one aspect, which is the convergence of multi-fidelity data and modeling. And how do we put this together in order to accelerate uh, battery R&D? So uh, let me first give acknowledgement to all those who have contributed to the work um, that I'm presenting today. Um, we have a large center funded by the Toyota Research Institute here in the United States uh, called Data-Driven Design um, for Batteries. 
and it involves institutions from across the US uh, and a number of theory, experimental, and data analysis groups. Um, we are directed um, by Martin Bazant um, uh, at MIT, who also leads uh, most of the theoretical efforts here. And all the work I will present today are collaborative uh, for our center here. <clears throat> So let me just give the obligatory slide on the key challenge in batteries, which is really the dynamics and the heterogeneity. And what we need to do is, of course, to embrace it. And I think uh, many of you have seen variations of this cartoon here. And I just show it one more time to highlight all the many length scale that one encounters in lithium ion batteries, all the way from the watt hour at the cell level to the picowatt hour at the particle level. And of course, you can go even deeper into the atomic level as well. And again, this is another slide that uh, variations have been presented many, many times, but let me give my version of it. Um, it's not only the time scale, but also the length scales. Um, so it goes from the picoseconds of a single lithium hop all the way to the many years of the lifetime of a battery cell and a battery pack. And the way we see it, especially at Stanford, is that we start at the materials level, and this concerns the material chemistry, the nanomaterial design, and then you go into the device level, and this would be the cell stack, um, the cell itself, and then you go to the systems level uh, where you are looking at uh, whether it's an electric vehicle or uh, for stationary grid storage. And what we are trying to do here is to cross cut it with synthesis and manufacturing, characterization and modeling and analytics. And this is a very um, substantial challenge. And I think one that Battery 2030 Plus is addressing very much at its core is to bring people together. So in addition to the, um, the team that we have um, with uh, others in the US, we also have a very large team at Stanford. We have nearly 200 PhD students, uh, faculty and staff and postdocs working on all aspects of energy storage, not just for lithium ion, but also other next generation storage technologies. And these are just pictures of some of my faculty colleagues who are engaged in spanning different parts of this time space plot. And um, as uh, Christina and Thais introduced, um, I also direct the Storage X initiative. And for those of you who are not familiar, please come and see our website. Uh, we have uh, a really nice webinar series uh, that features academic, but also industrial researchers working in the area of energy storage. And we cover not only electrochemical, but also mechanical, um, and uh, thermal heat storage as well. So with that introduction, um, I thought I would go straight in. Uh, I, I told Tyson and, and Christina I would skip the, um, the usual battery introduction slides as this is a battery consortium and, and really pinpoint, I think, to be the heart of the challenge. The heart of challenge in my mind is as follows. And I think Tyson has already highlighted very strongly. AI and machine learning, or whatever you want to call it, uh, in terms of a data-driven process, often it is difficult to extrapolate. Uh, you can interpolate very well, but if you go into regimes that you have not seen before, if you're designing a new battery chemistry, a new electromaterial, a new electrolyte, it becomes difficult to extrapolate to those conditions. And our goal uh, in the field is to develop models that can be transferred to different things, including on um, design spaces. In this paper uh, that we wrote earlier this year, I think summarizes really well, which is ways to combine physics-based model, those are in blue, and also the machine learning model or the data-driven model, which is in pink. And the various architecture here, and this is a plot uh, that has been coined uh, by my colleague uh, formerly at Toyota, Turn GV Gopal, uh, where we have different ways of integrating physics-based model and machine learning models. So you have sequential learning uh, on the top, that's the top three, and then also hybrid learning on the bottom. I won't go into the specifics here, but what I will do today is to give you examples of several of these, how we are merging the physics models and the machine learning model together. And again, the goal at the end uh, is to get the best of both worlds. Um, let me 
start with my take home messages. I think this will give a context to, um, I hope, uh, enjoy the rest of the presentation. Um, the battery community, um, and, and I see many friends and colleagues represented here in today's seminar, thank you for coming. We, we have excellent models that describe electrochemical data. However, um, because these models are so complex and attempts to describe everything, identifiability remains a challenge, which means that can we uniquely identify all the parameters and all the underlying physics? So this is a key challenge, especially dealing with complex multi-scale phenomena. The second take home message is that our understanding of very simple things, um, things like phase separations and reaction diffusion kinetics in electro, these are textbook items. They are complicated by heterogeneities and also emergent mesoscale physics, and they're not fully understood. Um, and this is one of the challenge that speaks to the first point, which is this is difficult to have models that also captures heterogeneities and, and other physics. So to address these challenges, uh, we have to use multi-fidelity, multi-data stream approaches so we can begin to understand the fundamental mechanisms of battery operation. This is the key to transferability. We know the underlying physics, then we can extend it to new things. And then we can identify the appropriate models to do so. And then finally, as the title hints, we are hybridizing data-driven and physics-driven models, and we're doing so across many scales, particles, electro cells, and beyond. So with these take home messages, um, I hope uh, you will allow me to go through several, I think, interesting examples for my group. Uh, I think most of these are, are very new work. I think some of them, um, even Thais probably have not seen before. And I hope to um, uh, uh, catalyze some discussion in the field as well on how we can converge data and models in, in a unique and interesting way that helps, um, helps accelerate the R&D pace. So the way I will organize my talk today is to basically walk you through four examples across this space time plot. I'm going to start at the nanomaterials level, and I'll use several um, chemistries to illustrate my point. So let's get started here. The very first example I want to talk about is lithium iron phosphate. So uh, as uh, uh, many of the old timers know, that uh, this material has come into favor, falling out of favor, but today it is falling in favor again, uh, thanks to our colleagues uh, here just down the road at Tesla, um, who has really made it uh, well known that uh, LFP is going to be very essential um, to the um, rollout of mass market EVs, and, and Volkswagen has also made similar commitments as well to this chemistry. And uh, this chemistry is, has one property which stands out. It has a very large miscibility gap, which means that it likes to exist either in lithium rich or lithium poor compositions. So as such, phase separation is an inherent characteristic of this material. And what I wanna show you here is equilibrium phase separation is inadequate for explaining what happens in this material. So here it, I'm showing you a picture of lithium 0.5 iron phosphate. So this is a half charged uh, lithium iron phosphate. I'm showing you several particles uh, that we image by X-ray microscopy. And you can see these beautiful phase boundaries. So red is lithium rich, green is lithium poor. And you have these uh, uh, nice phase separation happening. And we can also do this movie um, in, in situ. So this is a movie showing the phase separation happening in progress at the nanoscale. Let me play it one more time. So you can see again um, the uh, conversion from green to red, so the insertion of lithium. And as you would expect, it really follows equilibrium thermodynamics quite well. This is done at a rate of C over six. And if you do a careful analysis of the composition, you can see that it either occupies a, a, um, a red or a green, so it means it's either completely rich of lithium or completely empty of lithium, and there's nothing in between. Uh, and this is consistent uh, with the equilibrium thermodynamics of lithium iron phosphate. But intriguing things happen when you begin to ramp up the rate of the experiments. So now this experiment is performed over 30 minutes. And I show the same kind of movie again, uh, except now that I'm starting now with lithium poor and I'm putting the lithium back. And you can see when I crank up the rate by 10 times, then these phase boundaries really completely disappear. 
And more intriguingly, rather than going only to the lithium rich or lithium poor composition and avoiding the miscibility gap, you can see the movie actually goes through the composition in the middle of the miscibility gap as well, which is thermodynamically forbidden. So lithium iron phosphate, therefore, by these in situ movies, you can see do not uh, work via the equilibrium phase diagram. And um, what I want to do here is just to introduce the underlying theory at a very high level and then dive into how advanced data analysis uh, powered by AI could really help us understand what's going on. So the reason why we're able to avoid phase separation here has a very complex origin, and it has to do with the overpotential you apply to the system. So you start with the equilibrium system, but we're cycling the battery under some current, and that current means that you have to pay a energetic penalty. You can think of this as an IR drop or uh, over potential at the interface, however you want to think about it. And the unique aspect of all battery electromaterials is that the kinetics is a strong function of composition. So in the case of lithium iron phosphate, as you put lithium in, the kinetics changes with composition. And this is an experimentally measured curve from actually extracted from these images, where I show the resistance is actually very high for intercalating lithium when it's empty and when it's full of lithium. And the resistance is the lowest at quarter filling. So a lithium 0.25 iron phosphate is, with, uh, is when you have the lowest resistance. So what does this do to the phase separation? Well, um, if you go back to your um, a freshman chemistry, freshman thermodynamics, uh, you might remember that phase separation happens when you have a non-monotonic chemical potential curve. So the system is unstable against perturbation. So if you park your uh, battery at the middle of, of the, um, uh, the free energy curve and you just give it a, a little nudge, then it will partition into uh, the two bimodal regions uh, of the phase diagram. But this is what happens when the system is at equilibrium. But what if the system's away from equilibrium? So as I noted earlier, we have to add uh, this overpotential to the uh, chemical potential. And effectively, what the overpotential does is it shifts the shape of the free energy curve as a function of composition. So these various blue shades I'm showing is as you increase the current, the overpotential plays a bigger and bigger role in the system. So this yellow region I'm showing you here essentially is the kinetics or the um, the overpotential experienced uh, by a lithium ion as it intercalates. And you can see it is not constant across the composition, rather it's variable. And the reason why it is variable is because the resistance depends on composition. So if you apply sufficient current, you tilt the black curve, which is the open circuit um, metastable chemical potential curve into the cyan, which is what you get at a sufficiently high current. And you will notice you turn a non-monotonic curve into a monotonic one, which means the system is now stable against separation. Now, let me come to the AI part. I presented a set of images, but I only showed very trivial data analysis, right? I basically took all those movies and, and, and images and put that into that single curve you saw. So how do we do that? Well, here I'm gonna show you an example of a hybrid learning process where we have a complex physics-based model and we're using a smaller machine learning model and experimental data in order to learn what's going on. So the, the, the title says everything. We're learning three things. The non-equilibrium thermodynamics, we're learning the reaction kinetics, and we're learning heterogeneity, which I think is the most exciting part of this work. So, Allow me to show a differential equation. So we're essentially developing a phase field model. And I highlight the three terms we're trying to learn mathematically. The orange term is basically, how does the kinetics depend on position? So that's X. The red term is how does the exchange current density depend on concentration? So that's what I showed earlier. And then the blue is the free energy functional. So how does the, uh, the open circuit behavior changes with composition. And what I will show you is by using this hybrid approach, we are able to learn all three things, heterogeneity, kinetics, and the thermodynamics when the system is far from equilibrium. So how do we do so? So we take this entire 
model and we develop an inverse learning mess, uh, inverse image learning method. So I'm showing you a bunch of battery particles here, very similar to what I showed before, but I have a pair. So the left one is the experimental data and the right one is the simulated data from our inverse um, learning fitting. You can see we have captured um, the images very well. And what I wanna add here is we assumed very little fudge factors in the system. In fact, the only fudge factor is the heterogeneity. And the heterogeneity is assumed to be constant for a given battery particle. So what we have done here is we have cycled each particle multiple times. So you can see some recurring particle shapes here. And we're using a single FFX to describe the system. Importantly, we also use a single J naught of C. And we also use a single G of C to describe the entire data set. And this data set has about 100,000 individual data points. So this is an extremely constrained data analysis, but it also shows the power of image analysis because three functionals have to describe the entire data set. Um, this is the data set going from lithium poor to lithium rich. We can also do the reverse. So now this is going from lithium rich to lithium poor using exactly the same model with the three functionals. And what I hope you can see here is we have excellent description of the data. And with all this said, what have we learned? We learned three things. We learned the free energy curve that's in red. We learned the reaction kinetics that's in blue. And then we learned the heterogeneity, which is in green on the right. So let me walk you through it. The red curve basically shows you a learned free energy curve from our non-equilibrium system. So what I want to highlight here is it is very challenging, other than using first principle methods, to learn the free energy landscape inside the miscibility gap. But because our system is far from equilibrium, it is possible to learn the free energy landscape. So between about lithium point um, 03 and 0.97, so that's the bimodal points here in the phase diagram, in the middle, really anything can go. But we have now this very rich data set of non-equilibrium data spanning this composition. The dashed line is theory that we have developed previously using first principles. And then the red is what we learned from the images. So there are some interesting deviations, um, but now we have a full experimental data set. Again, I want to emphasize, we have one curve here that fits all the images I showed before. Um, so I think it's quite exciting to see that we're able now to extract the non-equilibrium free energy curve. The plot below is the exchange current density, so J naught, again, as a function of composition. So I showed you already a, um, a earlier version of this, but this is now the learned version. Again, a single curve that describes the entire 100,000 pixel data set from what I showed before. And again, you see the kinetics is really maximized at quarter filling of lithium ion phosphate, which is again, responsible for avoiding phase separation in the material. The last, which I think is the most um, interesting and I think the most uh, um, unexpected learning is heterogeneity. So you will see that in the movies I showed earlier, they didn't have the very beautiful face boundary uh, in comparison to the nice movie I showed in the, in the earlier slide. And the reason is also simple. Um, lithium ion phosphate are carbon coated uh, in order to provide electronic conductivity, but this carbon coating typically is not very uniform. So this non-uniformity then introduces a variation of the exchange current density at the particle level. And what we have done here is for every unique particle, which we have multiple cycles of data on, we use a single heterogeneity map. So how the exchange current density depends on position in, and then try to describe the data. And what I wanna show you here, I think is something quite remarkable. The left column shows you the learned heterogeneity. The second column shows you the experimental heterogeneity, which we uh, derive using OJ microscopy. And you can see a very remarkable agreement. Again, um, this is a fudge factor of source because this map has no physical constraint, but we do use it to explain both the charging and discharging 
of multiple cycles for each particle. And I think this experimental validation gives a lot of confidence that we are able now to learn heterogeneity. And let me also say the following, if we do not account for heterogeneity, we cannot describe the free energy functional and we cannot describe the exchange current density because they are not constant with position. Um, let me again just highlight this as being an intense collaboration over six years actually to get to this point uh, between MIT and Stanford primarily. Um, and, and this is something that uh, we will be putting out momentarily as well. So now let me move on to the second example, still sticking with lithium ion phosphate and still sticking with mesoscale and nanomaterial design. I wanna talk about mechanics. So lithium ion phosphate is also uh, very interesting in the sense that when you go through the phase transition, there's about a 5% change in the lattice volume. So mechanical consideration becomes very critical at the interface. And one of the things that any mechanics expert will ask you is, well, um, you know, what is the Young's modulus um, of the material? What is the Vagar law for the material? So how does the lattice constant change with composition? So here we are confronted with a very similar problem as the previous slide, which is, well, um, for the most part, we know the behavior of the system outside of the miscibility gap. But what happens to material inside the miscibility gap? How does mechanics um, how do we understand mechanics inside the miscibility gap? So here we again turn to this multi-fidelity approach where we measure these nanoparticles that I have shown before by several techniques. So this is an example of correlative imaging. So we are measuring the lattice constant, so a direct measure of the lattice string using four-dimensional scanning transmission electron microscopy or 4D stem. Because the particles are quite thick um, uh, as they are typical for battery materials, so we're not able to measure composition with the TEM. So we use uh, X-ray imaging to measure the composition. Okay, so that's the left column. So we have lattice constants and string from 4D stem, and then we have um, composition from X-ray microscopy. Then using you know, very standard image learning and image processing, we then combine and stack um, these images into a multi-feature image stack containing both composition, which is chemistry, and then also a variety of information on the lattice. So that will be your A lattice constant, C lattice constant, and so forth. And then comes the really, I think, exciting and I, I believe innovative part, which is to develop a simple machine learning framework in order to extract the underlying physics. So we seek to extract something very simple, which is what is the lattice constant as a function of composition? So essentially we are validating Weigert's law, but we want to do so not only outside of the miscibility gap, but also inside the miscibility gap. And this must be done with physical constraint. And here we use the minimally viable constraint, which is mechanical equilibrium. All we say is the particle is not moving. The strain is conserved, the stress is conserved locally. So you see that in the first equation there, and that's all we do. And I'll show you what a tremendous impact this can have on the image analysis by applying such a simple constraint to the system. And the Seiko equation shows you the, what we're trying to solve. We're trying to understand strain as a function of, uh, a stress as a function of strain. And then I will explain in a bit, strain has multiple uh, contribution in this material, both um, the elastic strain, the non-elastic strain, and also um, what's called the eigenstrain, which is the compositional strain in the system. So let me begin to walk you through uh, what we have learned. And before I do so, this is also an example of sequential learning. So we are coming up with a physics-based model, and then we are sequentially integrating it with the machine learning model and feeding in the experimental data and then outputting uh, the crucial physics, which is the, uh, the mechanical properties that I'm highlighting here. So let me walk you through what this problem means graphically. So what I'm showing you here is if you take one of those particles I showed before and you just plot the lattice constant, so for example, the A lattice constant of lithium ion phosphate and then versus composition, you will see the spread, okay? So the extreme 
points, that's the equilibrium composition. So lithium poor, lithium rich. So you see a lot of clustering there, but you also see sparse points in between. Basically those sparse points come from interfaces in the system. So as you go from lithium poor to lithium rich, you have to go through everything in between, even at equilibrium. And that's what the phase field, the kind of Hiller model described very well. And what I want to highlight here is for the experimentally measured string, which is the y-axis, you have two contributions. You have your eigenstrain, which is not dependent on the stress, and then you have your elastic string, which then depends on the stress. And there are also non-elastic terms I'm not showing here. So graphically, what happens is the following. So let me pick the lithiated iron phosphate as a reference. And now let me pick any random pixel of data. Okay, so this represents one point in the map. So the total displacement from the reference, that's your total string. And you have a eigenstrain. So this is the compositional dependent part. And you can think of a compositional dependent part as just the Weygart's law, okay? So you have a stress-free particle, okay? And then you can take the difference and say, this is the compositional strain. Of course, in reality, there is no stress-free particle. Stress is everywhere because you have phase boundaries. So you have another contribution, which is the elastic string. And then you have also other string on top of it too, including non-elastic string, such as a, a dislocation string. So the objective here is by incorporating mechanical equilibrium, I want to extract the eigenstrain or the compositional string and the elastic string. And I want to do so in the form of a map so that I can map out what is happening inside the material. So let me show you the data. This is an example. Uh, we've done uh, many, many particles here. We have the compositional map on the top. We have the A and the C lattice constant on the bottom. They're extracted from complementary TEM and X-ray microscopy. The one on the right is what I would call a data-driven analysis. So we're just plotting all the pixels and seeing what's happening. And I, again, I want to highlight the middle of the plot is the miscibility gap. So in principle, we have no knowledge of this region um, because we're not really able to quench the material inside the gap. But we have data here nonetheless. And again, this is concentrated at the interfaces. So the interfaces contain minority number of pixels, but we're learning about the um, behavior of the system under mechanical equilibrium, but inside the gap. Let me first skip to the quantitative results and I'll show you the images. The quantitative result is we are learning and validating Weygaard's law at the nanoscale. So this plot shows you the eigenstrain or the compositional strain as a function of composition. So you can see we have two lines here, a solid line, which is what we have learned using our inverse image learning model here. And then the dashed line, which is a data-driven model. So there's only one difference between the two models. The data-driven model does not assume mechanical equilibrium. So in the data-driven model, we're just taking the composition at a pixel and we're taking the lattice constant and we're dividing the two. And we can readily extract the expansion um, there. So we don't have to worry about um, uh, mechanical equilibrium, but the solid lines do. And what I wanna highlight is, although the plot on the left look very similar, in a mechanics term, what is important is not just the eigenstrain, it's also the derivative which is known as the chemical expansion coefficient. So very akin to the thermal expansion coefficient. So that's the derivative of the plot on the left. And you can see here, the inverse learned model versus the data-driven model without the physical constraint actually behave very differently. And this is actually the first time that we have learned the mechanical property of a battery material inside a miscibility gap. And we have actually done more than that. Because this is an imaging data set, we're also able to learn the locations of all of these features. So let me walk you through the image analysis. So this is the experimental observation, again, composition, and the strain map, the total strain map along the three crystallographic axis here. We are using the model to extract the compositional strain or the eigenstrain, okay? So this is done by imposing the equations I described earlier. We also extract the elastic strain um, by using the mechanical equilibrium I described. So now you have three contributions. So you have two contributions to the total strain. 
And if we take the differences between them, we're also able to obtain the residual strain. And this is very interesting now. So this is basically strain that cannot be explained by elastic strain obeying mechanical equilibrium and then the compositional strain similar to Weber's law. And this is now a visualization of non-elastic, non-compositional strain the system. And I won't get into the details here, but you can refer to our preprint which shows that this is a result of dislocation strain, which is not surprising because as this material undergoes phase separation, a dislocation cloud sweeps through the material as the phase boundary move in and out of the system. What I want to again emphasize here is we have taken very rich data sets, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands of pixels, developed a very, very simple machine learning model, use simple physics to constrain the system, but the outcome is a very transferable quantity, which is mechanical properties of material. And this can now be incorporated into mechanical models at the electro level, at the particle level. So this is my second example of um, learning nanoscale physics uh, using machine learning. So now um, I think I have about uh, 20 more minutes. Let me now get into my third example this is also a very interesting example of learning heterogeneity. And now I'm going to switch from lithium iron phosphate into the ternary cathode. So these are your nickel manganese cobalt oxide. And then we're going to start asking questions at a slightly larger length scale. And this length scale, which I will describe in a moment, is called the ensemble length scale. So we're viewing the behavior of the system at the many particle level or the population level. And I'll just start with the data. Uh, what we have done here is we have taken your regular NMC. So we have done NMC 111, 532, 811, the manganese rich cathodes, and we see something very pervasive across all compositions, which is that when you perform these experiments, you have this very unexpected evolution of X ray diffraction pattern. So the experiment is very simple. We are taking X-ray diffraction as the battery is charging and discharging. And that's what I'm showing you on the right here. The top half of the plot is charging and the bottom half of the plot is discharging. This is done at C over 15, so a 30 hour battery cycle. Uh, for those of you who have done this experiment, this is very classic, right? So you have nearly Weigart's law. So the, the lattice constant is contracting and then um, expanding as the battery um, is being delithiated and then lithiated again. It's very symmetric between charging and discharging, which you would also expect. Rem remember, NMC is a solid solution material, unlike lithium iron phosphate. So you do expect a very smooth um, change in the lattice volume. So nothing exciting here, but what happens, which is quite unexpected, is when you go to a high rate, so this is relevant for fast charging. And here I demonstrate an extreme rate just to, to make a point, um, but the phenomena also exists at lower rate as well. When I go to 4C, so 15 minute charging and discharging, then the charging and discharging becomes highly asymmetric. During charging, you see what appears to be a coexistence of two lattice constants. Um, you know, without further information, often what people will say, ah, this is a phase separation or some sort of a, um, a coexistence of two lattice constant. And what is actually quite intriguing is that this doesn't occur on discharging. It only occurs on charging, which is quite puzzling if you think about it. So if I were to summarize here is we have the appearance of phase separation in quotes, only during dilithiation and only during high rates. So we were puzzled by this observation. Again, we see it across the board, all NMC compositions, and we wanted to develop a general model. And again, I will show you how machine learning has helped us to learn how and why this X-ray diffraction pattern behaves the way it does. So one thing that is absent in the X-ray diffraction pattern is it doesn't tell you how lithium is arranged in the battery. It only tells you the average behavior of the system. So what we have done as a secondary data set is we've quenched the battery, meaning that 
we stopped the charging, we removed the electrolyte very quickly, and then we took the particles out, and then we imaged them particle by particle. So why did we do this? So here in these microscopy experiments, we lose the dynamics, but we gain the spatial resolution. In the X-ray diffraction is exactly the opposite. We have the dynamics, but we don't have the spatial resolution. So what I want to show you here is we are combining two kinds of data sets, one with very high time resolution and one with very high spatial resolution. Neither are perfect, but when combined, they can yield a lot of information. So let me walk you through the microscopy data. So here again, I'm showing you starting from the fully lithiated state. So this is a discharged NMC and we are charging it. And then we are um, uh, charging all the way to lithium 0.5. So you can see very standard behavior here. We have 12 particles represented here uh, as example, and you see the histogram. So it's quite normal. You have a, a slight spread about the mean. But when we charge the battery quickly, we see something more interesting. So when you charge it very quickly, you see this bimodal distribution. So you have the emergence of lithium rich particles and lithium poor particles. Um, and I will come back to why this is actually a very significant finding. So the behavior of the system here isn't very uniform, and there is some partitioning of lithium between the particles and not just within the particles. So how has machine learning come in here? Machine learning is maybe an over description of what we did. We just did a very simple model selection process here. And this is another example of sequential integration uh, with parameter identification. So what we want to learn here is what are the models that can describe the two data set I showed earlier using a single model? And what I'm gonna show you in the next few slides is we have taken two competing models. One model is what we call the reaction limited model. So this says that the electrode electrolyte interface is the bottleneck for intercalation in NMC. And the model on the right is a diffusion limited model, which says that it is the transport of lithium within the particles that limit the kinetics of the system. So they're very different. So one is interfacially limited, one is bulk limited. So we first use the microscopy data to select the model. And then we use inverse differential equation solving to fit the model to the X-ray diffraction pattern because the X-ray diffraction pattern is very, very rich in time. So you can see now we are fitting basically the time series. And then together, we're able to learn all the relevant parameters in the system and also identify how um, the kinetics is controlled uh, in this NMC system. So with the mechanics explained here, let me show you what we have learned. So if you ask any regular person and you say, how can I exist, like how do I want to explain this existence of two lattice constants during charging? The most common answer you will hear is, aha, it's diffusion limited. Why? Because if you have a diffusion front, then you will have a lithium poor region and a lithium rich region. So first, let me show you our simulation. This is a multi-particle simulation showing you the uh, delithiation and the lithiation of NFC. So charging followed by discharging. So let me play the movie here. Uh, so you can see this core shell behavior in terms of composition, and this reflects the moving front and the slow diffusion of lithium within NMC. And this is actually fitted to our experimental data. So it accounts for the dependence of the diffusivity on the composition of the material. So you see this very nice emergence of a core shell this emergence of multi-modal um, uh, distribution in the system. But let me now show you this movie one more time, but now I want you to pay attention to these two plots. This plot is showing you the histogram. The one on the left is the real-time histogram, and the one on the right is the quenched histogram. So the quenched histogram means that we're averaging within a particle, okay? So this best corresponds to our microscopy results. And what the quench diagram in, in, in Burgundy is showing you is that although there is a phase for moving, if you average the composition for each particle, the, the distribution is uniform, it's single model. And it makes sense, right? Because you have a lot of diffusion fronts in the system, but there are no significant differences between the particle. And that's what you saw in the movie that all particles are behaving more or less the same. 
you can already see that this simulation is inconsistent with our experimental data because we showed at high rate charging, you have this emergence of a bimodal distribution in the quenched particle composition distribution. But this model does not predict that at all. So we already got a sense this is not the reality. So what is the reality? The reality is actually the diffusion limit, the reaction limit model, whereby the slow and the bottleneck is not the bulk transport of lithium, but rather the electro-electrolyte interface intercalation. Let me show you the movie first. So again, we fit this to our exper uh, experimental data, and you see in a completely different picture. You see this, uh, why I call the mosaic effect or sometimes the popcorn effect, where the differences exist not only not within a particle, because there are no more diffusion front, but between particles. And now let me play the movie again and let me direct your attention to the bottom left, where I again show the histogram. And now even just by eye, you can see the emergence of this bimodal distribution because you have particle that lithiated first, uh, sorry, delithiated first, and the particle which delithiated later. And this is actually a fit of the model to our full experimental data set for the time resolved data for X-ray diffraction and also our spatially resolved data through X-ray microscopy. So this is again validated against a very large data set and I'm just showing you the simulation here to do it. So it ex explains all facets of the data. So what new physics have we learned? So we see this very unexpected ensemble mosaic behavior at the many particle level. So the explanation is actually not too far removed from that of the lithium ion phosphate case, which is again, the reaction kinetics of NMC depends on the composition. So this is a measurement from impedance spectroscopy where we measure the exchange current density as a function of lithium composition. Note the y-axis on the log scale. So when the material is fully lithiated, the kinetics is very slow. And as you remove lithium, the kinetics gets uh, faster by about two to three orders of magnitude. And then if you look at the, the current voltage relationship on the top as a function of um, um, composition, you can actually see what looks like kind of a phenomenological butler volmer expression, which is further confirmation that this is an interfacially controlled system. I would say this is not a commonly accepted view in the battery community. Um, again, if you survey the field, they will tell you NMC is diffusion limited. But what we have found here through our multi-fidelity evaluation is that this system actually can only be explained if it's interfacially limited. So let me now walk you through the physics. So this is known as an autocatalytic reaction. So battery material is, has a very interesting property, which is as you intercalate or deintercalate, the kinetics is changing. So imagine you have NMC with some initial inhomogeneity. This could be homogeneity in size. This can be homogeneity in the interfacial kinetics and so forth. And then now that's delithiate the material. So as you delithiate, the reaction kinetics is getting faster. So this means that particles that is already partially delithiated will delithiate faster moving forward. So this is really, and, and pun is intended here, that the rich is getting richer and the poor is getting poorer. So rich meaning lithium here. So this amplifies the heterogeneity in the system due to this autocatalytic effect. And remember earlier what I said is we see this only on charging, but not on discharging. So what is the difference between charging and discharging? Well, that kinetics curve is flipped, right? So now if I go to discharging, I start with the same um, heterogeneity initially, but now the kinetics rather than speeding up is slowing down. So this is exactly the opposite of autocatalytic. This is known as autoinhibitory. So the kinetics is slowing down. So the rich is getting poor and the poor is getting richer. So what that does is it restored the system to homogeneous distribution. So here, again, it's the same particle, it's the same kinetics, but you flip the direction. So the system autocatalysis has a very asymmetric effect because of the shape of how kinetics depend on composition. And then finally, you might say, you know, does it make sense for the system to be reaction limited? And the answer is yes. 
When the system is reaction limited, it means the interface is different in composition between all the particles. But if the system was diffusion limited, actually the interface is the same, okay? Because the interface exists inside the particle at the moving front of a diffusion phase front. So in order for the autocatalytic effect to be present, each particle must have different kinetics to begin with. And that's what I want to highlight here. And the major learning through this very simple model selection, simple machine learning model is to be able to identify that actually reaction is limiting, not diffusion. Again, I would say this is still not well accepted in the field. Uh, and I present this data to you as a way to try to convince you that you need different types of data in order to establish what's going on. And this is a system where we have taken two data sources, combined it with electrochemical data, and then took a simple population model, a porous electron model in order to explain what's going on. And then just to further convince the, the battery engineers in the audience, you know, I showed earlier with no diffusion limitation inside the porous electrode, but what happens if you have a thick electrode, say 100 microns in a real battery? So the same phenomena still applies, except now there's also a diffusional gradient inside the porous in the electrolyte. So you still have this mosaic effect, but you have a bit of a moving front, not within particles, but within the electrode. And that's what this simulation is showing here. All right, I'm coming to the end of my talk here, and um, Thais actually already showed some of the work here. So I now just want to spend a few minutes and say, I have shown a lot of stuff at the nanomaterials level, at the electro level, but how about the system? So at the end of the day, we are making battery cells. Um, and we have also been very pleased to do this type of hybrid uh, data and physics-driven model at the cell level. And I'll just show you a few examples of uh, work that we did uh, about five years ago that we published two years ago, right before COVID, shows that we can predict um, the behavior of battery using early um, battery performance. And what I want to show you here is a data set that we have collected. One of the tricks uh, we have gotten really good at is using battery cycling conditions in order to uh, impose variability in the data. As, as most of you know, um, batteries are extremely homogeneous at the cell level, um, especially at the beginning of life. And that makes any data training very difficult, uh, model training, uh, because of lack of variance in the data. So the trick we play here was we cycle the battery differently under different temperature, different depth of discharge, and so forth, in order to impose a variety in the cycle life. And what I want to point out here is if you take a look at this data set we have, this is also on lithium iron phosphate, um, you, you have a lot of variation, and I represent the cycle life with color. And if I were only to look at the first 100 cycle or the first 10 cycle, which is on the bottom, it's a zoomed in region, there's basically no difference um, and no significant correlation between the initial behavior and also uh, the total cycle life. And what is also interesting here, as, as most battery engineers know, usually in the first 100 cycle or so, the capacity is actually increasing, not decreasing. And that's what we see here as well. And if we go ahead and correlate the capacity at the early life or the degradation rate at early life, and we correlate that to the cycle life of the battery, there's actually extremely weak correlation. And this at first might be disappointing. It basically means that early cycle life or early cycle life, uh, early capacity degradation is not predictive of the cycle life of the battery. And what we have done here is say, well, we have a lot more data than just the capacity fade curve. We also have individual IV curves. We have individual cycle. We have impedance data. We have other forms of data. So what we have done here is we looked into the differences or the evolution of the voltage curve between a few cycles. For example, here I'm showing you the evolution between the 10th and the 100th cycle. And then we featureize that data. And this is a completely data-driven model. No physics is imposed here. We're basically looking at the summary statistics of the green region on the left. But surprisingly for such a simple and trivial model, we are then able to make very good predictions of the cycle life of the battery all the way out to about 3,000 cycles, only using the first 100 cycles, and actually more precisely, using only the 10th and the 100th cycle. So this speaks to the power of a data-driven uh, approach. But the problem here um, is we are not learning 
the mechanism. We're only offering an engineering tool. So therefore, if I have a new battery, I have to completely redo the training data set. Uh, and I think Ty showed a, 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 a slide earlier showing the need for transferability between chemistries. So now we really need to learn the mechanism. And this again is another example of a, uh, a physics constrained learning, but this is a data heavy and the physics is very, very sparse. And the reason is simple. We don't have all the physics. As I mentioned in my take home messages, um, porous electro theory today, uh, they're very well developed, but the parameters are difficult to identify because there's so many of them. There are typically two dozen parameters that have to be specified. Even if you offer additional measurements and maybe it's on the order of one dozen parameters. So what we have done here, and I just have a, a few slides to show here and, and I will conclude, is we are developing a very simple physics-based model. It's the lightest possible version of a, of, of a porous electro theory. And, and most practitioner would not call this a porous electro theory model. And what we're trying to learn is the capacity fate curve, but we're also decomposing it. In addition to classifying the capacity fate trajectories, we are also learning the lithium inventory and the electro misalignment as a function of the state of health. So as the battery degrades, the two electrodes degrade differently due to SEI formation, due to impedance growth, due to um, mechanical um, loss of material. When we encode this extremely simple conservation of mass model, this is being uh, used very extensively in the battery field. This is typically called a differential capacity analysis. Then we're able to learn the positive electrode mass, the negative electrode mass, and the lithium inventory as a function of the state of health for our entire data set. So this data set actually contains about 400 individual batteries. And we're now able to map the degradation trajectory that's on the bottom row there, showing you how the lithium inventory is moving in this battery depending on your aging conditions. So this is a light physics model and combined with a very large data set is able to tell you the aging mechanism, not just one, but multiple aging mechanism for a given battery. And then this is my final slide. Um, we have also shown that this ability to predict the lifetime of battery early on can also be fed into a autonomous cycle to achieve a certain objective. So this becomes a very powerful ingredient toward this, uh, uh, what Thais mentioned as an accelerated battery optimization or battery development robot, whereby we're able to explore a complex design space and then additionally sped up by doing each experiment quickly. So let me now show you the take home messages again. We have gone through, I think, a, a few, uh, four examples of how we are bringing data and physics together. And hopefully I have convinced you it is important to develop these models so that it can be transferred. And we have to go beyond just, I would call classical machine learning and classical AI. And the reason is very simple, batteries, battery chemistry, battery engineering, obey very strict physical laws. And if we can impose and understand those physical laws, then we can do much more of the data we have. So um, Thais and Christina, if I can show a self-promotional slide, uh, I also wanna tell you that uh, here being in Silicon Valley um, and battery being very close uh, between academia and, and commercialization, uh, uh, we have actually just recently started a, a company called Mitrochem that is integrating all this innovation I showed you, but not just in the acceleration, but also in chemistry and supply chain. And we are actually um, now developing next generation iron-based battery cathodes. Um, our company uh, have just raised $20 million. We're just about 15 minutes from Stanford. You're welcome to come and visit next time you're in the Bay Area. And uh, to, to those who are interested in coming to the States, we're also hiring. Uh, we just moved into our beautiful 15,000 square feet facility, whereby we are practicing much of what I just described here, but aimed at a very disciplined problem of delivering a new battery chemistry in a record time. So with that, Thais and Christina, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Will. Beautiful presentation. Um, 
I uh, encourage you to ask uh, questions to Will in the chat or in the Q&A, uh, preferably. Um, I would like to, uh, to start off by maybe asking a, a philosophical question. I have a number of, of technical questions here, but uh, uh, there's a philosophical one. I think you've illustrated beautifully how much we can learn from existing battery chemistries by the use of, of, of hybrid uh, physics aware or, or, or physics based and data driven models. Where do you actually think the biggest push will be? Will that be in, you can say, accelerated understanding of existing materials in the utilization or improved utilization of, of those materials? Or would it be in the, you can say, prediction of entirely new battery chemistries, uh, entirely new cell designs, where we're really sort of exploring uh, chemical phase space? Nice. This is an excellent and a challenging question to respond to. Um, I think that is the dream, right? So the dream is, you know, can we start using these new insights and to make predictions? So for example, you know, Thais, um, in your, your expertise in uh, ab initial calculations, I think some of the data, some of the physics we have learned, for example, the chemomechanical relationship or the free energy functionals can be predicted, right? So while our data is sparse, it provides some additional validation for your model. So for example, mechanical properties, as you know, is one of the easiest to compute uh, via ab initial methods. So we have actually now also tried just basic computing the lithium iron phosphate uh, elastic properties, which now we have experimental data to validate. So I think there's some loop that one can identify. Um, another thing is also just the tools. So if you have a new chemistry, it will be helpful to learn these basic things, right? And once you learn these basic things, quickly, then you can add that ingredient into your knowledge. So we can, for example, learn the mechanics of lithium, right, metal for lithium-based um, battery. We can learn the mechanics of silicon graphite composite, right, which is now coming to the market. And that could be another interesting example. And then finally, what I want to mention is perhaps the biggest near-term impact is actually on the electro level and cell level engineering. So the final example, the, the second to last example I gave on NMC, the two movie I showed are completely different, but today's PET model assumes the former, which I am pretty confident is incorrect. And that has consequences, right? So when you have a more accurate model, then you should be able to have a model that you can optimize around for a physics-based design of a battery electrode. And this has a lot of impact on the development of stress inside a battery. Um, you talked about cell repairing battery, you talked about battery sensors. So I think in this sense, these transferable insights can actually inform cell level engineering very critically. You know, to what extent it can help make a vastly better battery, I don't know. But I think at the very least, it will make a more predictive model. And there I have some confidence it will lead to a better battery. Very good question, uh, answer indeed, sorry. Um, can, I, can I ask, I, I'm still waiting for, uh, for people to, uh, to ask specific questions, but can I ask you to go to slide nine? Because one of the things in the predictive models and the use of multi-fidelity data is also uncertainty and uncertainty quantification. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you've shown uh, really the value of, of, of using, uh, you can say, multi-sourced, multi-fidelity data, both operando data and, uh, and the post-mortem data. But if I looked originally at the, at the slide you had, I think slide nine, um, where you show the data at, at low lithiation, uh, I think you have to go back to the original start of the slide, I think, yeah, here. Right, you essentially just have one data point, right? And if I was going to do uncertainty quantification uh, on this, where where would you sort of, or maybe let me put it in another way, if if you were asked of the, the the importance of uncertainty quantification in in these types of you can say data sparse uh, predictive models, uh, is this something that you've taken into account? I mean here and, and also when you do uh, the learned uh, non-equilibrium free energy a little bit later, the importance of, you can say, of getting uh, transition states or, or concentrational uh, uh, regions, right? Hmm. Is that something that you are factoring in? 
Yeah, so Ty's an excellent question. I always say uncertainty identification is perhaps one of the most important aspect of all of these because we're dealing with fairly sparse data set. So, so I guess, as you can see here, we have error bars here. So one of the, the reason why we are so gravitating toward images is because we have a lot of data. So, so, so this, this map here is constructed from about 100,000 pixels. So, so if you're only looking at one pixel, the, 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 the statistics is horrible and you don't really know what's going on. But once you combine it, I don't have the error bar for the machine learning model, but they're actually, most cases, very small because you're dealing with a very large N here. So we have about 100,000 combinations of composition um, and, um, uh, and position in the system. So I think that this is, again, why I want to highlight these multi-fidelity data set is extremely important. So you need the data points in order to have the reduced error. So let me, let me show you this one here. This is a good example, too. So look at how much scatter we have in this data. It's huge. It's huge because this reflects the measurement error, right? And also differences um, between the system. But if you look at our fitting, right? This is the confidence interval. I believe this is the 95% confidence interval. It's actually very, very narrow in the system. And again, it's because we're, we are fitting a simple model to hundreds of thousands of points. And again, this is why we are gravitating toward image data. Um, cycling data doesn't have this many data points. Um, so we are also thinking how to bring these high fidelity data and combining it with a low fidelity data like electrochemical cycling. But absolutely, uncertainty quantification is the key to almost everything we do here. And if you, and it's all buried in the details of the paper, um, but you will find that the treatment are extremely essential. Maybe just I'll allow myself a follow-up question here because this is uh, extremely, extremely important. So one of the challenges you can say in, in, in sort of the overconfidence in some of the purely machine learning or data-driven approaches, uh, do, you, do you foresee that sort of the physics awareness or the physics constraints, and I think this is a beautiful example here, um, do you think that is a, sort of one of the ways uh, forward combined with the, you can say, the uncertainty quantification uh, to, to really uh, leapfrog the, the development? Ties absolutely. I think there can be nothing more problematic than being misguided by the wrong physics, right? Because our understanding of batteries have guided us this far, but in order to make the next better batteries, we have to have the right physics going forward. There's really no room for error. And, you know, I just challenge everybody to think, you know, what if the thing you thought is the most true could not be more wrong, right? So the diffusion limitation I showed in an MC is one such example. And when you have the wrong knowledge, it can really lead you astray. And um, you know what I think we are going to be able to do here is, well, let's see, what we will prevent is the following. We have seen even in just the past two to three years, this massive effort to train purely data-driven machine learning models on data sets. That's not a hard problem. You can almost always find a model that describes the data, but often they suffer from overtraining or inadequate understanding. So you have to really evaluate the physics that comes out and so does it make sense? Just because the model works, it doesn't mean it's transferable. So let me just give the simple example. You can fit a data to a polynomial very easily, a multi-order polynomial, but can you take it across your data set, no, absolutely not. If you have a third order polynomial, but you have a monotonic data, then you're gonna get it wrong, right? You won't be able to extrapolate. So this is why understanding the physics perhaps is the most thorough way to validate your data-driven analysis. And this is, I think I'm seeing this as a challenge in the field because data sets are becoming very available and it's easy to throw the machine learning models, the conventional ones at it. And the only metric of success is, does it describe the data well? But it doesn't tell you whether it is actually um, a, a good model, right? Especially for unseen data set. So I hope people resonate with that idea. And this is why, um, you know, although we have published a few paper on data-driven analysis, but at the core, we always see it as step zero to this longer process of learning all the underlying physics and then the goal is to have a model that really can be extrapolated um, beyond the training data space. 
Thank you, Will. I have one more question uh, from Alessandro Rossi. Uh, I'll just read it out loud and hopefully you will be able to answer it uh, here. Uh, incredibly interesting presentation. My question is a general one. How close are we to use such specific models at a molecular scale in applications like evaluating the convenience of utility scale BESS plants? Since as far as I, oh, one more. Since as far as I know, currently to do similar studies, one creates a model at system level, basically neglecting or drastically simplifying what happens at the small scale. Um, oh, so Alexandra, thank you so much for this great question. Actually, this is already being done. So, We've learned all these things about lithium iron phosphate, and lithium iron phosphate is a key candidate um, for BESS plants. And we've already developed a multi phase porous electro theory model. Um, Martin Bazan's group has been doing this. So we actually have already a public version that incorporates the physics we have derived from our work, put it into a simple to use package. And what that will allow you to do is a better model than the conventional PET models at capturing lithium iron phosphate graphite um, cells. So they will do a better job um, you know, in terms of managing BESS, in terms of predicting um, cycle life, in terms of battery management system. So yes, the answer is this has consequences from an engineering perspective, absolutely. Thank you. And if I can squeeze in one more question before you are, are let go for your morning in uh, San Francisco. It's a, uh, I don't know who it's from, but uh, it, it relates to the uh, NMC study and the inhomogeneity. So the inhomogeneity of, of NMC during the initial charge process you presented, could, be, could that potentially be caused by surface uh, lithium residues, lithium carbonate? This can be reflected from the high overall potential at the beginning of the charge curve, around 3.7 volts. And if the Li residues are not formed at the surface at NMC, this inhomogeneity phenomenon could be uh, could have disappeared, right? <laughs> um, the short answer is uh, is it's, it's not right. Um, so the this hypothesis was put forward a, a number of years ago um, by um, uh, Corinna Chapman, Claire Gray, and others, where they saw this heterogeneity and assigned it to lithium carbonate formation, which I think is a very reasonable hypothesis. So we did several things here to make sure um, or to rule this out. Number one, um, all of our data are collected not only in the first cycle, but also the 10th cycle. And I think we have data also at the 100th cycle. So it's extremely long lived. So it is not uh, something that only happens during the first cycle. So that's probably the most direct uh, observation. Secondly, uh, because the nickel rich compositions are indeed very sensitive to um, carbonate formation, not just bicarbonate, but also carbonate formation. So we actually perform our entire uh, cell um, electro coating process and uh, electrode assembly process inside the glove box. So there's no CO2 exposure at all. Um, so it's not just done in a dry room, it's done inside a glove box. So for those reasons, um, we do not uh, see this as a first cycle effect. Uh, and it's something that's quite repeatable. And our paper actually contains these details probably buried under figure S37 or something. But I encourage um, 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 the person who asked the question to take a look at our paper to see some of our arguments around why we don't think this is the case. Thank you very much for answering the questions also, Will. Um, I don't have more questions here. We are also uh, up in terms of time, but I would thank you very much for a beautiful presentation, for the, the great answers and for taking the time to, uh, to visit us uh, virtually. So thank you very much, Will, and have a, a great day. Thank you. I hope to see you uh, in person soon, I hope. <laughs>